Hello everybody, welcome to the Canadian Shield, your trusted source for analysis. My name is Sterling, I'm your host. The NDP MP, Gazan, has introduced a private member's bill demanding that the criminal code be adjusted to make it illegal for anyone to say any negative or any, to go against the narrative of the residential schools. Now, right out of the gate, I will tell you, I do not believe in censorship. I do not believe that this is the same thing as what they've done in Germany to stop people from doing that. I don't believe that we can equate the two of them in any way, shape or form. Now, I'm going to let you hear it before I tell you my something. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to table an act to amend the criminal code promotion of hatred against Indigenous peoples. Mm. If passed, this bill would add to the criminal code the offense of willfully promoting hatred against Indigenous peoples by condoning, denying, justifying, or downplaying the harm caused by the residential school system in Canada. So I suppose it's about time that I started to talk about the residential schools as it, you know, as it's a strong impact in Canada. But what this woman's wording is, is that she wants to make it, if you deny residential schools, you're talking hate speech against First Nations peoples. There are First Nations groups that never had residential schools, right? Let's remember that. I mean, I get that the narrative indicates that, but this is something that's just not the situation. Plus, I didn't let you hear the whole thing that she said because... This woman is, she's saturated in hatred. I mean, she's just angry, you know? Now, when the, when the government started printing money for, you know, all of the reasons, they decided they would try to buy some First Nations votes, and they said, well, we're going to give you a bunch of money for, to find, you know, to res, for the residential schools to look for the people and to, to see if you can find the names and the records and maybe some of the burial grounds. Now, before I tell you some of the problems with that, what what is important to understand is that the government recently decided that they didn't have any money for it anymore. And there's another group of people that came out and they talked to the, on on the reconciliation day, they talked about the the cut in the funding. And there was uh, four or five of them. Two of them at least were residential school survivors. So I I want you to hear some of the things from, from this group. To ensure that as we do our work that there is sustainable funding in place to ensure that the work can be completed and we can say the name of every child who attended the Mohawk Institute as part of our work to uncover those who are still missing and in unmarked burials. So I want to start with just letting you know that in 2021 Canada announced funding to support approximately 144 First Nations communities to begin the work into unmarked burials and missing children's investigations. We were to learn this past July in a teleconference with Canada that that funding was being reduced to 91 million over two years. Because of that announcement, Canada essentially was informing us that communities were going to be pitted against each other to try and access a limited pool of funding that was available across the country. Okay, so you heard, that you saw a difference there, right? How this, this individual, this woman, she's, she's obviously angry and hurt and all of that, but she's not coming at it about with a bunch of laying the blame. She's simply saying that the process of, of discovering and getting to the recovery of this, of this wound, of healing this wound, is going to require some money that the government has all of a sudden decided now that they're not going to pay anymore. And instead of allowing for the 141 groups to have the same amount that they've always been having, the federal government is making everybody um, go after, like separate, right, to, to, to go after each other to see who gets what money, which will invariably leave some people and some groups out, <clears throat> which was why they tried to cap, right? Because they said, okay, we cut it down to 91 million, there's 141 groups, so if we give everybody a half a million dollars, everybody will be happy, but a half a million down from 3 million, which doesn't seem like a very, I mean, there's not, that's not proportional, right? I can get it, you can say, oh, 3 million down to 2.5, or, you know, you've done an audit, and you don't necessarily need to see where all that money, and I get all that, 
But this was just a hack and slash that the Liberal government is doing across the board because they've run out of money. Because like all socialist governments, they don't have any money to spend when they run out of other people's money. But I think what I wanted to show you is the contrast between the anger of, of saying you're not allowed to say it about anything anywhere ever. And this lady who was like, okay, well, there's 141 different bands that are, you know, that are participating in this search. We have a list of recommendations that we are pressing Canada to implement immediately. The first is for Canada to truly work towards truth and reconciliation. And we ask that in doing that, that they give survivors access to their own records, including all 23 million documents identified but not released to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, and all RCMP records related to missing children and unmarked burials associated with the Mohawk Institute and all Indian residential schools. That Canada provide robust, stable, long-term funding for investigations into missing children and unmarked burials that communities be able to self-determine the type of aid and required supports to lead their investigations. That Canada honour the promise of reconciliation based on truth by committing formally to a complete account of the Indian residential school experience. And that Canada ensure funding support for memorialization and public commemoration remain a central part of this work. And finally, we ask that Canada include funding support for the creation of spaces for sharing, learning and healing. Okay. I don't think there's anything unreasonable in those demands. I, I, I would much rather give money to solve this problem to, because what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about reconciliation. We're talking about healing wounds, right? We're talking about a, a, a body of people that are, you know, that we, we can't go backwards and fix it, but we can certainly try to put the, the, put them to rest. And we, we know this, we do this all the time. That's why the Vietnamese wall, the, 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 the Americans put up a wall memorial for Vietnam. That's why we have the tomb of the unknown soldiers. I mean, we are not a, um, strangers to this entire process. So making, getting these wounds to heal, I believe is a, is a, is a, it should be considered a very important aspect to lead to reconciliation. Now, I don't believe that MP Gazan should be the one running the show because she just wants people to be punished. She just wants people to be you know, punished. She wants to harm people for what she perceives as a personal insult. I've seen her in committee. She takes everything like it's all, you know, it, she's the center of, of attention for every single solitary problem that comes her, down the pipe. Does that mean that we should not consider reconciliation to be a paramount aspect of the Canadian experience no i believe that it should be quite the opposite i think that if we really want to integrate these systems if we really want to bring people back to the table if we really want to tell ourselves that we're a country who's trying to solve the the problems and make people that are in this country feel like they're welcome we have to put this to bed now she made a couple of very reasonable requests 23 million pieces of paper is a staggering amount of paper i will speak to the unmarked graves that she mentioned two times so, okay, so here's the thing of it, right? We talk about the First Nations people being here and they were um, migratory, right? They moved back and forth across the, with the herds. And you're all familiar with the story. They followed the food where it went. They followed the weather and all of that stuff. So if, if that's the case, then where are all of the cemeteries, Right, so you can't you 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 can't think in your mind that they were marching up and down all around the the entire continent, and there would be no cemeteries anywhere. Whereas, by contrast, you go to Europe and you see, or you know, it, yeah, Asia, you see these these stones have been there so long, the vegetation has overgrown them, and all of that stuff. And that's not to say that there wouldn't have been people at the time to know where the where the you know where the bodies are buried to take a term. But it is to say that they didn't work with carving headstones, right? This is something that you need to remember. You have to put this into the forefront of your mind. That marking of graves would have been done with wood because there, wasn't, there was no quarry 
they didn't, the First Nations individuals, the peoples of the First Nations didn't do that kind of stuff. They didn't um, mark their graves with stones like we do in other parts. And how long did we have to go before we realized that marking a grave with a stone was a way to make sure that the mark would stay, right? Because wood, it falls to pieces, it gets blown away by the wind, all of that kind of stuff. Whereas you put a giant rock there, it sits still, wet rain or shine. So to say that we, we have, we, you know, I don't believe that the schools, these residential schools would have had the money. So, so you know, a tragedy happens and a child passes away. A sc- these schools were run by priests, right? All of them. Like there was, a, depending on who you ask, there was anywhere from, a, if you ask, like if you just Google it and you go to the Canadian encyclopedia, there's, they'll say there was a maximum of 80 in the, in the 1920s and 30s. If you ask the uh, First Nations groups themselves, they'll say there was 139. Okay, so either way, we'll go with 139. But they were all, of those 139, easily 125 of them were looked after by religious orders. So priests and nuns. Now, you can't expect me to believe that they would be put, they would, they, there was no way that you will ever convince me that they weren't put in consecrated ground. Where was that ground? That's a great question. And we'll come to that in a minute. However, I will say that it would be difficult to keep track of where they, of where they were put, not because nobody cared to mark them, but because the elements and the materials that would have been utilized. I and mean, when you think about the idea that your kids in high school right now, we can't even afford a gym teacher. You want me to believe that in those days we could go to a guy who could carve a headstone and then haul it however many miles from the quarry to the school in the middle of the woods or wherever that happened to be, you know, wherever the ground they happened to be buried and then put it there. Who had that kind of money? I mean, it wasn't like today's where you put it in a truck and buddy drive it over there for you, you know, and take a couple hours. That same trip in those days would have taken, you know, weeks. And somebody would have had been paid for all of that. So I don't believe that it's, it's, it's a case of, in, of, of intentious mal- intent to, to not show where they were laid to rest. I just believe that it, just like in the, in the example of the First Nations themselves, the material wasn't available to them to mark them in the way, the classic way that we understand, which is simply done to make sure that the, the mark never leaves, right? All right, now that I've covered that, and I, I, and in no way, shape, or form am I trying to tell you that it doesn't, it, nothing I say in this, in this video is intended to steal the hurt and the suffer and the pain. I am not trying to steal anybody's pain. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I'm trying to tell you that by acknowledging the pain is where we have to begin the process. Everybody's running around with their chickens with their head cut off, trying to worry about, you know, what, what are we going to do and unmark this and all of that kind of stuff. And, and the truth of the reality is we need to begin by talking about the fact that no matter how far removed they are from this process, it causes a scar. And that scar is where we need to begin the healing so that people can put this behind us and we don't have people standing up in the house of commons demanding that people get thrown in prison for you know i don't even know what but something that would be not relevant like not uh what do you call that a proportional response to saying you know speaking from ignorance there's a lot of people that come into this country that might not understand what's going on with the history of it and you want to be able to put them in prison if they say something off the cuff or if they say something that they try to compare to their own situation back in their country. And they tell you that, you know, like, so I don't, I don't agree with MP Kazan, though I will acknowledge that she hurts. Right. And that's what we're talking about here. So I don't believe there's anything that unreasonable in those five demands. I um, will get back to them in a minute, but I wanted to address the, 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 the reality of these unmarked. And that doesn't change the idea that we shouldn't try to locate them. I'm just trying to make you understand why that would have occurred. That's it. That's all. This is going to take a very long time because of the many complex confounding issues. Canada is a very large country, 
schools are scattered across them. All of these schools are in different biogeographic regions, different soil conditions, different histories of redevelopment, different vegetation, different climates. All of these complexities require that each community, each investigation, develop a tailored method. He makes a very good point. Now, I will say this, that the Catholic Church has done this ever since the beginning of time. They, when they left, they, t they teach people how to read and write, and they bring them into the church, and that's what they do. They did it in the Central Americas, they did it in the South Americas, they did it in the Philippines, they do it all over the place. They sent missionaries. Every time you hear the word missionary, what they originally do, they'll start with the school. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying that's how it's done, from their perspective. Now, he makes a great point, though, about the different ground that the, these uh, individuals may have been laid to rest in, because some of them may have been now abandoned and the, the vegetation has overgrown them, right? I mean, if, if for, for whatever reason they were, the, the, pat, the patch was cleared and then now it's, it's overgrown like some sort of, you know, uh, you know, jungle scenescape that you might see from Laura Tomb Raider or whatever, Laura Croft Tomb Raider kind of thing. I mean, they're not always going to be cultivated pieces of land because, as anybody knows, sometimes the ground just gets wild on you. Also, it's going to have an impact on the how the material stood up. We talk about these things like they're all going to come out of the ground like Tutankhamen or Tutankhamen or whatever is King Tut there. But that ground doesn't get a lot of rain. It doesn't it's not it's not very wet, and in North America, the ground is. So it's important to establish that because too many of us are thinking that it's all bones and you're just going to bring in some ground penetrating radar. We're going to see, you know, perfect outlines and stuff like that. But that's just not the situation. So I think the first thing is no search like this has ever happened in Canada before. So to put a dollar figure to it is impossible. I think the reality is, is what we're asking for is long term sustainable resources to ensure that the work gets done. And I think the reality is there are two ground points that I think are critically important. Um, ground search and geophysics are saying it's going to take at least 15 to 20 years for the technologies to catch up. Records and documents, 23 million documents still sit in the hands of the federal government. They have not been released. Those records were promised a year ago. It took us two and a half years to get through the 10,000 documents that Canada said they had. So we need the timeline, I would say, until every record has been searched, until the technology is able to answer the questions that need to be answered. And I think the reality is it, it shouldn't be an initiative. This should be a, a sustainable part of the work of Canada's promise on the calls to action 71 to 76. So right out of the gate, let's establish the fact that it's going to take, they're guesstimating 20 years to show that. Now, it's just, what you get back is not, like, it's not like on television, right? They put the, the radar down there and it looks for density and it comes back in, in, de, in just shades, right? So it could be a tree root. It could be the, that it's the remains of a coffin. It could be all of these kinds of things, right? So you'll never know without digging down. And of course, it's a six foot hole. Anybody who's ever run an, an excavator knows that that's not in, a, in and of itself, not an easy thing to do. So the the idea of looking and seeing like this bone jump out of you, like you see on, on Hollywood, is just not there and the experts told this woman who i believe is being very reasonable it could take up to 20 years to have that kind of stuff because so what that means is they have no idea right if it's if you're talking about 20 years you're talking about well maybe that's somebody's imagination going on that means there's nothing that's even close to it right now so let's establish that right to say to ourselves that we need to look we need to find this ground penetrating radar and all that stuff that is the that's not the place to start this process. Instead of looking at it from, from CSI, you have to look at it from the position of an archaeologist. And an archaeologist will always find a document to read about and see where things were. And then they'll go out and have a look and they'll track it down and they'll do all of that stuff. So now we're talking about 23 million documents, bare minimum which is a staggering number, right? 23 million pieces of paper. Can you imagine? However, 
There is no reason that we should not be taking individuals who are willing of the First Nations, of the 144 um, groups that this lady spoke about or or how, because she, she mentions how she's from Ontario, however many groups there happens to be in Ontario or however many groups there happens to be on out in the, out in the plains and training them how to, you know, work with documents, right? So you scan the document or whatever you do nowadays, maybe you type it over by hand, maybe you take a picture of it and then you put it into a PDF and then you take that PDF and you upload it to a private server so that an individual in, who wants to see these documents, who wants to start perusing them in a particular region of the country can simply download the PDF and they have it in their phone or they have it on their laptop or they, you don't have to think about 23 million printed copies of paper, right? It's not, we're not doing that anymore. But that's to me, the place to begin this process. Because in those documents, they're going to be talking about areas and places and names. And the idea is not necessarily to go, you know, exhuming all of these different um, locations, though I, I understand that that's the excitement and that's the drama of what the media might be trying to convince you of. I'm not looking at it from that perspective. I'm trying to heal the wound. And so, as this lady says, we need to know where those names are. And you can't tell me that the money wouldn't be better spent having those 23 million documents put out to the people that want to read them. And so hiring individuals with tax dollars, taking some of this money that the federal government is trying to utilize and giving it to these people so that they can do the job, right? So they can just go to work. What's your job? Well, I work in the 23 million documents of the residential school department whatever you call it. I don't know what you call it. You call it something. And then they have, you know, 10 or 12 people in there, one manager and a whole bunch of people that are just all day. This is all they're doing. They're taking groups, they're cataloging, they're organizing, and they're putting it up online so that people can, wherever they happen to be, reach out, grab those pieces of paper and begin to study them and look for the landmarks and look for the, the areas and the locations and the names that must be buried in those documents. Can you appreciate that some of all of these documents are the bulk of them would have been written by hand. So there's, it's not something that you and I can just jump right in. We're now we're talking about in some cases, there's going to be needed to be specialized training for that. And so starting at one end and working backwards is probably the way to go. Because even when you consider that the last school was closed in 1996, I mean, we had windows 93 in those days or windows 95 or something. So that, you know, you didn't even really have, you could take like three pictures with a digital camera. So you're talking about a lot of handwritten stuff and which is a lot of people sitting down and converting it into a digital format so that from there it can be sent wherever a person could read it in their, in the bathtub, a person could read it over the dinner table, a person could read it at the coffee shop. They could email it to their friend. And that kind of stuff will help people to solve the riddle and the names and all of the all of the lost names, right? That 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 must have occurred. Now I don't see how that's a waste of money in any way, shape, or form. I think that that's money well spent, and I have to agree with her that saying that there must be a, a, a commitment, a budgetary commitment to this problem is a great idea. I mean, it should be enshrined in law that X number of dollars are, are, are allocated to this. And some of those dollars should be to train people on how to work with documents so that they convert them into PDFs, upload them. Some of those dollars should be to put into committed, uh, dedicated servers so that there was always a location to store these documents. And then as the problem, as these um, pages are read through and as people discover things and as people say, hey, I'm going to go sleuthing with this section that involves around my neighborhood, then we can start to look at how we can, how we can localize and, and, and solve the issue of, of, of putting in, you know, getting the, I won't say zooming, but saying, okay, this area right here is where X number, you know, so many people are laid to rest and now we need to build, you know, we don't want people traipsing on here. We certainly don't want somebody building a house on here, that kind of stuff. But it, it has to begin with the documentation. I mean, that's what else can we do with, but find the clues that we need? Like I said, it, it's got to be done, handled like it's archaeology. I know it's very new and I appreciate that everybody's very upset about it. 
but let's just try to be rational for a minute. Let's just try and get to the, to the point where we can say, okay, this is where we know X number, X, Y, Z. And, you know, now maybe you can close that chapter and get on with living in not in so much pain and anger and all of the kinds of things that come along with that. Of course, because the Liberal Party is desperate to not look bad, they are saying, oh, no, no, it wasn't a funding cut. And the one lady said that to her. She was like, well, the minister is claiming that there was no funding, that it, the, there was no cut to the funding. And this is what I said to the minister himself. It's a shell game that's being played with words. Because how do you go from 216.5 million to 91 and say it's not a cut? And while people will say it was never a line item promise, what we would say is if this wasn't going to continue, why did you wait until nine months in to the funding year to tell people that the funding level was being reduced when it, just as recently as March of this year, communities were being told they could apply for up to three million per year for each of the next three years. So it is a funding cut. It's a reduction in funding. But he will say it isn't because he was saying it was time-limited funding when it was first announced three years ago. So three years now, we've been given $216 million a year, and they cut it down to 90. That's a huge budgetary, uh, re like that's a massive cut, right? That's not even 50%. That's more than that. But what I like about it is one good thing. We have a number, $216 million dollars. Now, if we want to say to ourselves, to solve this problem, to put these ghosts to rest, to make these people feel, not make them feel better, but to allow them to feel better, to get closure on this stain, to, to, to bring to light all of the problems that may have occurred, we need $216 million a year. Now, we just sent $10 billion to, we, we burned $450 million on the Green Slush Fund. 200 million ain't much at all. So if we say it's 216 now and we stop trying to look in, at ground penetrating radar and start to just work on getting the documents looked after the 25 million documents, that's an extreme number. So that's a lot of people handling those documents and creating the PDFs that are required. And I mean, that's a, that's an, that's a lot of administration right there. I think 225 million is money well spent. I think that that's a great place to begin. They're currently at 216 million. You want to cut it back to 90, but I think that if we get, if we say 225 million, we could probably hold that as a budget and allowing you know allowing shortages to roll over and stuff of that nature. So I think that we can probably sustain 225 million for at least another five years. And then of course you should re revisit the number because you know what who knows what in five years where people might have discovered something and then now we need to bring in tractors and we need to bring in excavators and we need to bring in archaeologists and I, they probably don't use excavators but you get my point the point that i'm trying to make is that you know we'll have to revisit revisit the budget and i don't believe that it's anything that we we can't afford i mean i would much rather give 225 million of this to this problem than the 400 million that we gave to trudeau's buddies on the green slush fund for example and helping solve this national rift this 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 problem which is has been thrown onto canada but you know there's a lot of there's a lot of factors at play none of that i want to be discussing in this video because the idea that i'm trying to get everyone to agree to is to just move forward here's the problem this lady says that there's funding's been cut and they want access to 200 or to 25 million pieces of paper, not to mention how many the RCMP may have. And I have to agree with her. I think that we should just let them have the paper. And you can't just, you've got to be trained to use, to, to get those documents. So we have to start there. We have to start by training, I don't know how many, let's call it 25 people so that they can handle these documents and put it up on online and, and look after from there. And if they need to go, to a location to train people on how to pull it down and what they can do with it. Well, that's fine too. Let's just go. It's 225 million. We'll get this process started from, from scratch here. We'll, we'll start it, start a go and make sure that it's a sustainable, as she mentioned, achievable goal piece by piece, plot by plot. And every time we, 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 we solve one problem, we now know that this problem can be duplicated in other regions. 
that's not talking about getting into the ground, but that is absolutely tackling the, the, the basis of this problem, in my opinion, which should begin with those documents, which means that we need to get the bureaucracy out of the way. We don't want anything on there that will, will taint the process. So we should just give those 25 million documents to the control of, like I say, a department staffed entirely by people from First Nations so that they can work on this problem at their leisure and in my opinion, 225 million, I mean, that's jump change in to solve this problem. And anyway, I get that it's a lot of money. And then if I had it right now, I'd probably be on a sunny beach somewhere, but that's a different video. All right, we're almost there. Well, there's two, there's two UN uh, special rapporteurs that have, um, have done studies on the rights of, of the dead and that it is an obligation by the state to provide the resources in order to recognize the rights and the issues that, um, that we're dealing with specifically in identification and memorials. And I believe that the UN should try to cut a check if they think that that's the situation. I don't like the United Nations telling us what the problem is. I understand that there is a lot of pain I understand there's a lot of anguish. I understand that there are children right now being, you know, who are listening to these stories around the table of the older people talking about it. And they're listening in the way that children listen when you don't really think that they're listening. And to say, well, what we need is, is to find the names and the memorials. I completely agree with you on that. We have a memorial for all kinds of things. We have statues and walls put up and names are, are, are etched in and I don't believe for one second that that's a waste of money I don't believe for one second that there would be a problem for that because what, what will happen what's the what's the outcome of this what's the worst that can happen you're gonna say oh well we solved all the riddles if it takes 20 years okay it takes 20 years but getting started, moving forward, having a plan instead of just saying, okay, here, everybody do what you want to do. Here's three million and, you know, go, go nuts. I think that we need to begin to start the process at the paperwork. And I don't know why the federal government is so anal about retaining paperwork. But certainly you only need a couple of two or three trained document handlers to get the ball rolling. And then once they have the digital copies or copies that can be handled by you know, people with a coffee cup or stuff like that, then those individuals can begin to the, the process of turning them onto the, into the PDFs and whatever else the documents are called when they send them electronically in this day and age. But if we don't begin the process, if we don't start this situation, if we don't tell ourselves that the best way to, we can put, our, put this problem to bed and the best way that we can, you know, get our most bang for our buck is to look at it methodically and logically. So we have to stop looking at it like we're trying to solve a crime and we have to start looking at it like we're trying to unlock a mystery, right? Which is why I say archaeology as opposed to CSI as opposed to some crime scene investigation. Now, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of anguish. There's a lot of frustration. Some of those people on that stage were actually went through this problem and some of them, a couple of them were very articulate. The lady who... Um, mentioned about what the UN said her her name starts with doctor so I don't say to you that I have all the answers but I do see a problem and I'm looking for a solution because that's just the way my mind works and when we consider that there are people right now who are just wanting answers and the amount of answers that could be locked in those pages the amount of pain that could be put to rest if they simply heard the name read out loud and they know where, you know, the quadrant or the, or the grid, or they at least know what happened, right? Because too many, too many, the mind goes too many ways. I mean, you don't know. It could have been the flu, right? You don't know what happened. And that, of course, is a problem and it allows for, you know, the idle mind and the devil's play shop and all of those kinds of, of things that people like to say. So I think that it's an unreasonable request to make it illegal to say whatever, but I do believe that it is a completely reasonable request to, to give these individuals the money and the, and the uh, latitude they require to put this pain behind them. I mean, it's an entire 
nation in pain. It's not one or two people. We're talking about 144 organizations just in this lady's purview. And I think officially there are 620 in the entire nation, in the entire country. So if when if we have overlaps and we bring in, you know, let's just work on getting this problem put away. That's my opinion. You can leave me what your opinion is down in the comments. All right, I'm going to wrap here. I want to thank you all for listening. I'll talk to you next time.